This is the Agile Uprising Podcast. Hello and welcome to the latest installation of the Agile Uprising Agile Manifesto Author Review. Um, We are joined this evening or afternoon, depending on which end of the phone you're on, uh, with uh, Stephen Meller of, um, uh, from the Agile Manifesto Signatory Group. I'm your host, Ryan Lockard. I'm joined by James Gifford. And uh, Mr. Meller, it's very, very awesome to have you on today. Awesome. I like it. Thank you very yeah. much. Well, the last, the last interview we did was with um, Martin, Martin Fowler. And mm-hmm. I said that I was very excited to have him on. And uh, he went through and listened to a bunch of the shows, and he said that I said that about everybody that we had on. So now I'm very yeah. conscious of how I introduce people. But I'm glad um, we got the NT to awesome then. Yeah, no, it, this is awesome, and I and I am very happy and very lucky to have all of you guys on. So, um, I guess to get started, um, when we when we talk to each one of you guys, you, you generally all have similar yet unique backgrounds and um, you come from different industries and you come from different disciplines and practices. And I think it's important to kind of start from the start before snowboard, before 2001, like in the, in the nineties leading up into snowboard, what was your history? What industry were you working in? And uh, what, what brought you into that fold? Uh, real time and embedded systems primarily. Um, I also did a lot of work um, with uh, code generation and uh, being able to you know, compile, just linking things together, that kind of stuff. Um, my first real job was at uh, CERN, the European Nuclear Research Centre, that I'm sure everybody is aware of. Uh, there, very junior, of course. Uh, I did some work on uh, linking up graphics packages, allowing people to compile across multiple machines, all that kind of stuff. Not that much in the way of control, but then I moved to Lawrence Berkeley Lab, University of California, and there, uh, there was a real-time systems group that provided support to a large number of um, uh, different projects, including the Bay Area Rapid Transit, the Tokamak Fusion Reactor, a couple of accelerators, blah, 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 blah. Hmm. Uh, and after a while, I ran that group, uh, providing common services to these things, and uh, worked specifically on the Bay Area Rapid Transit system board, um, where we did a lot of work, initial work, not real work, but initial work, um, planning out uh, just what was needed. And uh, there I met uh, Sally Schleyer, uh, the late Sally Schleyer, I should say. Mm. And uh, we worked together uh, after a short time on a consulting company, again, to real time and embedded systems, things like aluminum rolling mills. Uh, we then uh, moved into, just an example, chemical plants. It, it, the list is quite lengthy. And after a while after that, it became clear that what people wanted was not for us to consult, but to teach them how to do it. So we turned ourselves into a training company instead of a consulting company. And our biggest thing was an object-oriented method, uh, Schleyer Manor, obviously, uh, which followed from the previous work that I'd done with Paul Ward, Structured Development for Real-Time Systems. And <clears throat> that basically requires transformation of something into code. So you write at a high level, typically a graphical model accompanied by some text and generate code from it. And then we became a tool company. And then the next thing that came up was the unified modeling language, yeah. uh, which is, as everybody knows, an object-oriented uh, way of describing uh, systems graphically. Uh, however, uh, the object, the UML, the I should say this slightly differently. Many of the object-oriented method practitioners were using the UML primarily as a notation for communication, not for code generation. Mm -hmm. And so by the time we hit the 90s, 2000, and so on and so forth, uh, there was beginning to become a backlash, uh, which was uh, expressed, I think, first in Kent Beck's book, Extreme Programming Explained, which I read with some amusement. Uh, and that's kind of where we got to where we are. 
Okay. Um, I, I, I find it impressive um, that you blah, blah, blah reactors and accelerators. So that's a, it's, that's a, that's a hell of a history. If you can, if you can just skip over, if you could yada, yada, yada that. Um, so I guess as, as you covered a lot of ground right there, your interactions, you mentioned you read Kent's book, um, of the other signatories, did you have any professional, um, intersection with, uh, with any of those gentlemen? Uh, yes, primarily Robert Martin, I would say. I knew of Martin Fowler, of course, because of his um, UML uh, book, mm. which is very um, well received, I think it's fair to say. Right. Uh, Robert and I spent a good bit of time arguing on bulletin boards, uh, which is done with the music. Uh, Martin and I never had that much um, direct interaction, but I knew of who they were. Um, obviously, I'd heard of Kent and Ward and so on and so forth, um, primarily by the, you know, the specific work that they'd done, but not necessarily so much in what eventually became Agile. Um, so it was, it was pretty much with the XP practitioners then that, that uh, you had the, uh, the inter interaction? Yeah, I'd say so, yes. Yes, I, I knew I would say half of the people. Yeah. Um, I agree, but I didn't really focus too much on what they were up to. I'm curious, uh, because of the, um, the nature of the work that you had going on with UML, were you familiar with uh, John Kern prior to 2001, or was he somebody that you ran into first in Snowbird? Uh, I did. I had run into him before, but we hadn't had any real interaction. Real interactions with, with Robert Martin, uh, Martin Fowler to a lesser degree, and kept back through his books, or cutting them through his works, I think it's no. fair to say. Yeah, cool. Um, and then the Rogue River Gathering, were you a part of that in, um, in Oregon leading up to the Snowbird event? No, okay. Nothing to do with me, Your Honor. I wasn't even there. Nice. Um, so then, as you approached uh, 2001, um, is it safe to assume that Robert Martin was the, Uncle Bob was the one that reached out to you to get you your name on the list of attendees? He was. Okay. Um, so let's step a little bit, if you don't mind, into the mental space that is mm -hmm. that, um, that event. Uh, we're lucky enough that we were given um, both John Kern and Andy Hunt shared with us their, their, hand, their notes from the event. Yep. Um, not sure if you had a chance to take a look at them. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the one thing, a couple things, and I'm just trying to create the atmosphere to hopefully jog your memory a little bit about uh, of the event itself. The, what I find interesting is the notes that Kern shared with us were, or I guess, uh, pre-typed by Alistair. And in there, you guys, are, it was referred to as the Lightweight Methodology Conference, or the Lightweight um, Process Conference. LWP, LWM was all over it. And even when, um, when Andy shared with us a picture, he has a, sh a picture of the placard that was on the door of the conference room in Snowbird itself, and it said the Lightweight Methodology Conference. Um, when you agreed to attend, what was your intent of, of going? Like, why, why was Stephen Meller interested in going to this event? What were you expecting to get out of it or contribute to it? Well, there, there are two primary reasons why I thought this would be a good idea. Um, first of all, it was Snowbird in February. <laughs> What's not to like? Right. Uh, the second reason is that I wanted to find out what was really going on because I, as we have already discovered, was not that close um, to many of the people, the other signatories to the manifesto. Um, I do recall Alistair Coburn's uh, Uppsala conference, I think it was in 2000, where there was some big argument about ceremony versus process, whatever precisely he meant by ceremony was not entirely clear to me. Uh, but the main reason that I went there was to spy, and I was quite upfront about that. I wanted to know what the people were trying to achieve and the degree to which I agreed or otherwise with it. I like where this is heading. <laughs> um, so, were, so were there any problems you were looking to um, better understand or potentially start drawing solutions for, or was it mostly just for the, the, the opportunity to be involved and to, as you put it, spy? Uh, the primary thing that uh, concerned me was the deprecation of models. 
Hmm. Uh, even a, a Java program, even a JavaScript is a model of the sort. Um, and you can get into all sorts of pointless philosophical arguments about what makes a model. Most people go straight to graphical, which I don't think is required, but never mind. Uh, but essentially what um, I mean when I think about a model is some high level abstract view of something that takes away certain details, such as processors, data structures, that kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, and um, Kent's book in particular uh, was very clear that models were bad. Um, I could do my uh, imitation of the character from South Park if you wish. It's not very good. <laughs> uh, but models are bad, uh, I was told. And of course, I didn't agree with that. In fact, my entire business is based on models being good. And the primary, uh, the underlying reason people say that is because they think that models are just sketches and then you write the code. And that was not the view that I took, not at all. Uh, the view that I took was that the model was, in fact, the code. It just had abstracted away certain elements that needed to be filled out separately. Not added, but filled out, worked on separately. So if you say you have these attributes, fair enough, I can understand that. Then you could say separately, and I choose to store them in an object, or I choose to store them in a table in a database, or I choose to duplicate some of the data in this, uh, some of the attributes of this, quotes, object uh, in the machine, and I want to duplicate the data on an offline database and then generate some software also that does the necessary copies at the right time. So it's just saying that you have this particular property, this attribute, uh, is one thing. Saying how you implement it is an entirely different thing and it should be separated. That, that is super compelling. I'm curious, the, I, in 2001, I was, admittedly, I was still in college, so I wasn't in the professional space. Were that, that view that you had of models and that respect that you had for models as, as being part of the software itself, was that a unique view at that time or was that shared in any community? Uh, well, in the software community, it was, I think it's fair to say, unique. Um, as one of our consulting assignments, I went to a company uh, that sold uh, software to help people build analog devices. Basically, you capture your um, the circuit that you want, and then it prints it for you. And when we went there and talked to them about what we were doing, and sort of we're kind of slow about it and careful because this is such a weird point of view. They say, well, yeah, but he does that. Hmm. And then we have similar conversations with hardware people. And again, they have huge amount of tools. Um, the company, for example, that bought my company after reaching its near, very nearly reaching its 20th birthday, Mentor Graphics makes a good business out of selling uh, software that simulates, generates, and so on and so forth, hardware. And yet we don't do it with software. Hmm. So stepping back into 2001, the, uh, it was a two-day event, but I understand the, um, the first evening there was a, a gathering at the lounge or a gathering in the reception area of the resort itself. Um, did you happen to attend that, that first evening um, I gathering? Did. Okay. I did. Uh, I was in beer in the so, so I asked, I, I'll ask you a question I asked Martin as well. Do you know what beer you would have gone for first? Because uh, I'm a beer lover myself. I don't recall. That's far too long ago. I don't remember ah. what I had for breakfast. There's been too many beers since then. Well, that's also true. <laughs> um, so you walk into the lounge the first evening. Um, would you have, with your personality, would you have gone towards Bob Martin because he's somebody that you had a previous relationship with, or are you more the type of person, hey, I already know him, I'm going to talk to somebody different? Where, where would you have uh, taken yourself? I tend to talk to different people. I certainly talk to uh, John, I certainly talk to Ward, um, well, I certainly talk to Martin, I did know him a little bit, so I talked to him first, I think. But yes, so it varies. And the, the first evening was probably more of the uh, just making acquaintances and connecting with folks and not so That's much it. into the, the meat and potatoes of the conversation. Yeah. Um, so then, I don't know in your mind if you can abstract day one from day two of the, the formal Not meeting. Not I, yeah. I was, I'm currently thinking first evening. Was that the evening before we commenced in the morning or was it the, the uh, divider between day one and day two? Yeah. Yeah, the no, structure, I, 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 
I'm impressed with the ones that could do that because to your point, I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning either, let alone what I did 16 years ago. Um, and actually, coincidentally enough, yesterday, uh, no, we're on Wednesday now. So Monday this week was the 16th anniversary of the ending of that meeting. So yes, that's right. Yeah, so now we're, yeah, so we're officially, we're officially 16 years removed. So your memory is, uh, you're allowed to increment by one. Um, Next up, we're driving. <laughs> nice. So blending the, um, blending the two days together, because I think that's, that's mm -hmm. what happened day one versus day two is, is inconsequential. Um, the structure of the event itself is quite beautiful to me. You guys intentionally had morning session, uh, morning break, afternoon session, afternoon break, and then evening session. Um, I'm curious, first and foremost, what did, uh, since you mentioned that you were excited to go to Snowbird in February, uh, is it safe to assume you're a skier? Yes, or at least I was. I haven't skied for some time, but yes, I was. And I took a couple of days afterwards to have some amusement. Yeah, so did you take the, I imagine on the breaks, then you snuck off and hit the slopes a little? No, 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 I kept, kept going. There's always stuff to do. Yeah. Um, what about the format itself? Do you think that that contributed to the, the hyper productivity that you guys got done in two days? The fact that there, the, mm -hmm. there were those hygiene breaks? Uh, I think the idea of um, structuring it so that um, people have time to reflect on what they've done so far um, is, is a good one. Uh, I am horrified by how many people schedule two and three hour meetings and expect uh, something to get done. Um, after an hour, you've got to go away, write down what you have, make sure that you understand it, and then come back and say, you know, I didn't actually understand this. Hmm. Can you help me with that? Or as I looked at all of this, I see that such and such is important. Um, so yes, I very much like the idea of getting, um, switching from one subject to another. It doesn't need to be skiing, but switching out of the context to get some perspective is a good thing. Right. So you kind of, I think you, you kind of alluded to it with, um, with your expressed intent of going to the, to the event was to be a spy to use your own words. But, um, I think others, when we talk with them, they, they talk about you. And you really had um, strong feelings on things. There are a lot of alpha males in the room, um, but you, you had a um, you, you, you had a lot of strength in your perspective on respecting the integrity of software, respecting, I think the word code is used quite often when people refer to you and your position in that meeting. Can you speak a little bit to that, what it was that you were so um, strongly positioned for? Or, or uh, in the answer, what you were strongly positioned against in, 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 in standing in that position? Uh, sure. Um, the, I think it's fair to say that everyone, except me, of course, uh, was intent on contrasting code from models. And I don't think that that contrast actually exists. Um, one reason why the uh, manifesto says working software instead of working code is precisely because I jumped up and down repeatedly uh, having this conversation to say that is an important thing. Um, the specific thing that I went in um, trying to, well, the, 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 there's a whole bunch of different things that it's kind of hard to distinguish them at one level. Um, but one of them is I wanted to get away from the deprecation of models. They have their place. Sometimes you don't want to write in Java, sometimes you want to write in whatever is currently popular, sometimes you want to write in a different uh, way. And I didn't want us to be restricted to thinking solely and only about code. Hmm. And one thing that I, uh, one conversation I remember many times, um, actually, I must have had this conversation a minimum of 30 times. Hmm. And it went something like this. Okay, so my understanding is that what you're telling me uh, is that the reason the code is so important is because you can test it. Is that right? The answer came back, yes. And I'd say, okay, so if I can execute something and I can test it, that's okay, right? And then I get an answer which was a little bit more, yeah, because they know they're about to be correct. <laughs> and then, okay, so that means that if I can execute the model, that's okay. And came back the answer, no. And then I went through the argument again, sometimes with the same person, different people. I'd come back to somebody I'd convinced the night before and have the same discussion, and they found back to know models are bad, code is good. Uh, so I was very concerned about that. 
Um, I was concerned about understanding some of the specific techniques. Um, Test-driven development, for example, uh, strikes me as a very excellent idea. In fact, the tool that we eventually uh, developed, sold, uh, had a uh, explicit verifier that would interpret the uh, logic, the models that you constructed uh, before you generated code for the target. Um, so that made perfect sense to me. Uh, I was, um, I think I'll pick my words carefully, let's say disappointed uh, with the somewhat anti-capitalist view uh, that some of the uh, participants seem to have. Big bad corporations are right to stop us, brilliant software engineers from doing our best. I just simply don't believe that. Uh, and I was quite disgusted by some of the touchy-feely, let's all be friends and get into each other's pockets. Um, I am particularly also finally concerned about the attitude towards documenting. Um, I totally, utterly agree uh, with the notion that the code tells you what it is that the code does and nothing else can replace it and expressing it in English or whatever language you choose in addition to your programming language is a total waste of time. Hmm. But what that does not do is tell you why you chose this abstraction over that one. Um, sure. So it's interesting that you said that because everything that you mentioned there is very much in line with what I, I wanted, I'm, I might be giving the wrong person the credit here, but what Ron Jeffries had mentioned um, in talking about you, I think he said specifically, if it was not for Stephen Meller, um, it would not say code, it would not say software in the manifesto anywhere. It would say code everywhere. So um, I find it interesting that, you know, that that resonated so hard with others in the room. But I think, you know, looking back, well, no, I, guys, believe me, I expended a large amount of calories on that. One of the questions that we had in the original, one of the questions we had in the original list of questions was, do you remember any poignant uh, disagreements or arguments? And I think, uh, I, th I think uh, you might, you might've gotten tapped a couple times. We, we did ask that question. Yes, I was afraid of that. Yes. Why would you be afraid of it? I think working software. <laughs> no, honestly, I think working the word software in um, yeah. is one of the main reasons that the, uh, the manifesto has stood the test of time. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I think it's a little bit less threatening to um, managers. And I also think that it points to the future. Yeah. Um, so when, uh, when you guys started doing the, um, the values, because as I understand that the values were actually ratified in Snowbird, the principles mm -hmm. kind of came after the fact. Um, I think you, yeah. you guys worked on that via email or phone or something. Um, yeah. But the values themselves, the, this over that, um, do you recall the, the exercise that you guys went through to create those, to order those, and to refine and wordsmith those? Uh, well, I'm sure we've had this discussion about beer and breakfast before, um, so the answer is not very clearly. Uh, but um, I think the thing that struck, um, stuck out for me the most was the way in which people worked together to understand what the other person was saying, rather than trying to uh, impose their specific wording or idea onto the, uh, onto the principles. They were refactored, ho ho, uh, multiple times um, as we came to understand better what we were really trying to say as a group. Mm. Uh, and I, I thought that the manner in which we worked together actually was really quite extraordinary. Uh, people were respectful of each other's views, and I think that that was a big um, reason why the manifesto came to be what it is. Right. And then I, I, you're, one of your big contributions, one of the contributions that you made was um, the incorporation of the word software. Do you remember any, um, any conversations that you were jumping up and down about, to use your words again, um, during the value proposition or going through and, and the this over that um, conversation? Uh, well, one thing that um, exercised me was the anti-documentation um, uh, attitude and certainly I argued against that uh, but that really didn't end up in the principles. Um, another thing that I think um, is, well I know it was discussed a lot um, that I was involved in those discussions 
is the rather simplistic idea that in all cases you can take a user story and implement it. Mm. Now, if you have a large amount of infrastructure, you have your operating system, your user interface, your database, your web services, your blah, 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 blah. that's true, probably. Uh, in a real-time system, you frequently have to uh, construct some infrastructure mm. before you can actually deliver anything. Um, I mean, if you just take a raw machine, no operating system. If you're going to do anything other than have a single thread, you've got to do something to, to build that. And that's not explicitly and concretely and immediately adding user value. Uh, so there were a number of arguments uh, around that. Um, there were a couple of um, more real-time oriented people uh, in the room. And they kind of got the point. Um, but there was a lot of discussion. It never really ended up in the principles. But I don't really care about that. If uh, we understand that delivering user value is uh, the primary thing and getting those in a manner that we can do it so that the customer can be satisfied, uh, then explaining to them, well, that, well, sorry, we have to build this first, shouldn't be that impossible. I mean, people are reasonable by and large. So. No, I think that's it. I appreciate that. Um, so I think Alistair told us, the, um, I think the most um, clear story on the emergence of the term agile, right? Because the, again, the event was labeled as the lightweight methodology. And there's a, a high degree of consternation around it being a lightweight anything. Um, what do you, so to share what Alistair told us was that it was an exercise in reduction more than it was a voting method. So everybody had ideas um, what terms they wanted to define, to label yeah. this with. And you got, they threw it up on a board. And then we, we like I was there, no, you went through, you did a, an exercise of scratching off the ones that somebody had an issue with. Mm -hmm. And what emerged, what emerged was this term agile where nobody had a strong opposition towards it. And that's kind of how it yeah. became. Does that mm -hmm. sound, uh, do you have any memories of that? Um. Yeah, it was very much like the work that we did on the principles. People laid out what the fundamentals that they cared about were and worried less about the wording. Of course, this exercise is about picking a word. And um, I do remember conversations around extreme being too extreme and lightweight being too lightweight, which amused me a fair bit. Uh, but um, you can see that there was also a consideration of how this is going to play in the market, which I thought was um, gratifying. You know, if you go to your boss and say, I'm going to be extreme this week, uh, well, maybe not. You might be on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, if you say you're lightweight, well, your boss might think you are. You know, so it goes. <laughs> Uh, so I, I'm actually very pleased uh, with the word agile, though I now see it everywhere. I see it in relation to government, I see it mm. in relation to uh, manufacturing, I see it in relation to all sorts of things. It has, in fact, become a movement. Mm -hmm. um, so then let's go with that. I, mean, I, I did have other questions, but you, you're really opening the door to that movement. After 2001, you guys roll out the manifesto, it catches fire. And um, mm -hmm. I think it, first and foremost, did um, the exponential traction that got behind what you guys ratified there. Did you see that coming? Did you have a sense it was going to become something close to what it became? Or was your expectation more, hey, it's just, it was a chance to go up to Snowbird, get some skiing in, talk to some like-minded individuals? Oh, well, I think yes and no is the classic correct answer to that. Um, I, in retrospect, it makes sense. Uh, at the time, I was surprised. Um, the reason that I say that is that because the work that I had seen, for example, from Kent, uh, clearly had a very strong following. People would say, I've been doing this for years. I've been doing that. That's exactly how I do things, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, very rarely did they do exactly what's written in the book, but never mind. Um, the, but the idea that it resonated with, I'm going to say coders, just to be nasty. Um, <laughs> coders, um, clearly says that there's some uh, power behind it. But once it did actually get further out, yes, I, I was astonished. Hmm. Um. So following 2001, you went back to your company, I assume, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. you, you just continued on with your training and your development? Yeah. 
And also we had a tool, which is now uh, an open source tool. I can tell you about that if you care. Uh, but uh, we had a tool um, that uh, generated uh, software, just as I described initially. Mm. Uh, in a couple of cases, it's, described, it's generated hardware, it generates documentation. Uh, and we sold that to Mentor Graphics, mm. who I mentioned before, who have now spun that off into a separate entity. So, do you remember what the f once you went back into industry and you went back to your regular life? Uh, do you remember the first time you started seeing agile as a, as the movement starting to just appear naturally in the wild? Uh, I think I'd seen it a lot before, but the, sorry about that noise in the background. It's a mm. ship backing up. Mm. Um, does it? This time of day makes me crazy. Uh, so uh, let me see. Um, I think that the manifesto galvanized the folk who um, wanted to um, to code and not to document, uh, who wanted in some cases to uh, talk to users separately from the uh, strictures of the organization. And as a result, uh, caused uh, uh, caused this to kind of coalesce and become a thing, if you like. Um, so I've been seeing the elements of agile pretty much um, for probably for the last ten years, right? Why, why do why do I need a model? I just write code. Um, hmm. uh, why, why don't why why do I have to write um, uh, actions twice? Uh, that kind of thing. So all those elements were there. Uh, but the use of the manifesto and the word uh, kind of galvanized it and then it ran off. Yeah, and by ran off, I, my assumption is you, you start seeing it show up in the different trade magazines, in um, yeah. conferences yeah. popping up, and then conferences, spawning more conferences and more conferences, exactly. that, that, that type of action. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Now, I, 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 every time I do one of these, I, I say something and I find out that I'm wildly wrong. Um, and I'll, I'll take that risk with you as well. Um, you, I don't know that you, in the research I did on you, I don't know that you were ever a prolific speaker in the Agile circuit, in the Agile conferences. Um, mm -hmm. yep. it, did I not find that piece on the dark web that says that you were that guy? Or uh, is that accurate? And if so, why? Uh, no, it is accurate. Um, and it's because it wasn't really the center of my business. Um, either uh, personally or uh, from the you know, purely commercial perspective. Um, the, from my perspective, uh, Agile has a number of ideas in it. Uh, most actually are very good. Um, and of those, I'd say many of them are common sense and I don't understand what the fuss is about. And some of them aren't very good at all. Um, I have been expecting Agile to reach the top of the hype curve for a good five years now. Um, and there's, there's two hype curves. There's the Gartner marketing hype curve, which everybody mm -hmm. you know. There's a very similar curve that has to do with the underlying technology. Right, first of all, you know, take a different example, artificial intelligence. AI is going to solve everything. It's the greatest thing to try for conferences, conferences, conferences. Everybody wants to know what it's about. Everybody's excited. And so it goes and so it goes and then it doesn't deliver. Hmm. And then people say, well, hang on a second. That particular technique in there, deep learning, that actually is useful. That particular technique over there, pruning trees, et cetera, et cetera, uh, according to probabilities and, you know, all the different AI techniques, um, then become techniques. They don't become, uh, they're well understood because they've been in the market for 15 years. It usually takes about 15 years. So I just late. Um, they've been in the market for uh, a good amount of time. People understand them. There's no hype around them. So there's no reason to discuss them. You just use them. Right? I mean, you just go off and use them. You don't mess mm. around talking about it. You just use it. Um, and then the ones that were useless get tossed away. And I'm perfectly okay with that. And I've been expecting that to happen with uh, Agile for some, some time, actually. Uh, but it ha I, I'm not really seeing it yet. I've got, got a couple of Agile Alliance notices this morning. Um, and fair enough. So I'm perfectly happy to talk about uh, generating code. I'm happy to talk about... Um, the the way manner in which you can work with people 
efficiently to get the information that you need. Mm -hmm. uh, I am happy with the notion of um, picking the most value user stories, but I add my um, you need infrastructure uh, thing on it. Uh, I am very unhappy with the idea that you don't document. I'm very unhappy with the idea that we all sit around a tribal fire until we learn just exactly what we're doing. Uh, all of those ideas, that, that's just awful. Uh, Test-driven development, great. So mm -hmm. that's, that's that. um, So I'm mostly interested not in uh, quotes, agile. I'm more interested in the underlying um, underlying components that make it work in a particular situation. And I actually don't, what's the word I want? I don't want to say don't like, because that makes it sound too personal. I think it is, um, dangerous is going too far. Uh, let's go with dangerous for the minute and let's see if we can find a better word. Um, I think that the um, adulation of agile um, is dangerous. Um, because what it does is that it stops people thinking about what the underlying techniques are, so long as they're agile. Now, if this is not an exaggeration. Uh, I, where I am at the moment, it's just across the street from a bank. I was walking across the road the other day, and I saw some fellow with a T-shirt on, 16 years, as you point out, after the event, saying, agile is a state of mind. And I almost wanted to quote to him and shake him. Fortunately, I was not wearing this. Agile that? Manifesto author t-shirt. That was the 10-year thing. And it's a total accident, by the way, that I put this on this morning. It's only when I was reminded that it's a video that I thought, I think I'll keep it up. Hmm. Um, but I wanted to shake the fellow. I mean, this is silly. I mean, you need to understand the techniques, work with people, deliver value, get on with it, stop ranting on about Agile. But now I'm not going to stop. So uh, when you started, you had said that there are parts of uh, the... the movement of agile that you think are common sense, some that are good, and then some that are just downright bad. Um, yeah. uh, you also dove a little bit into the, um, the anthropological aspects of it, the sitting around the fire piece, um, and then some of the, uh, the non-documentation elements. Are there other elements that get wrapped into the concept of agile that you categorize as bad beyond those? No, I think that's pretty much the list. I, um, I like the, the word anthropological. Um, because that's kind of the center of my of one of my concerns. Um, the manner in which we work together, I thought was very um, was very good indeed. Uh, it was respectful. It gave people time to say their piece. Uh, people weren't trying to have an argument. They were trying to understand to come to a conclusion. Um, and I think that's how people should work. I, I don't see why that's such a big new thing. Mm. Um, but I was not happy with the idea that so, so many of my fellow signatories seem to believe that corporations were deliberately trying to stop you from doing that. Uh, and I also uh, had difficulties with the idea that we just really, all, if we were all just friends, we'd work it out. Well, maybe, maybe not. I'm not friends with everybody, but we can sit down and say, well, what's the problem? Let's start it out mm. uh, and get on with that. So I, I, I found that a little bit um, disturbing. And when it came time to sign, uh, I don't recall my exact words, uh, but they were something along the lines of uh, some of this touchy-feely stuff makes me sick, but I, I agree with the underlying principles and I'm very happy to sign. I, I believe I've heard almost verbatim what you just said. I don't think it made the interview and I can't attribute to who said it. Even if I could, I don't think I'd say it, but I believe okay. somebody said that you said that. So that's interesting. Um, I do want to take a moment to talk about the no documentation because um, I, I, I work in, uh, in what I consider to be an agile fashion. Um, and and I run into this quite often because I deal with architects and I, I believe that there is value in proper architecture. I believe in, um, to your point, um, self-documenting code and things of that nature. The problem is in what people believe documentation to, to be. And mm -hmm. is the way that the, the way that the value is written isn't that we do not document, that we favor um, working software over um, uh, 
uh, I, sh I should, I should be able to get this right at this point, but over documentation, oh, over, right. yeah, over extenu extenuous documentation, copious documentation, however, however you guys more eloquently wrote it than I can remember. Comprehensive. Yeah. Comprehensive. Yeah. Thank you, James. You let me hang out to dry that long. Thank you, my friend. Um, <laughs> um, it's not that we're saying that documentation in and of itself is bad. It's just the proper documentation for the, to make the software meaningful, sustainable and yeah. the abilities, right? Yeah, no, I'm perfectly happy with what you just said. Um, but th this goes back to my choice of the word dangerous, which still isn't right, but I'll, I'll come up with it eventually. Hmm. Um, but the, um, what many people take away is not what you said. Hmm. What they take away is no documentation. And I don't think that any of us, and I include myself actually in this, has spent um, anything like enough time talking about, well, what documentation is required? Um, I mean, some things I think are fairly obvious. Why did you choose, why did you not choose this abstraction and choose the one that's in the code instead? Uh, what is the rationale for this design decision over that design decision? I mean here, not, um, specific ways of doing abstractions or code, but rather the rationale for choosing to put things on a small machine or a bigger one or, you know, the, the bigger architectural issues. If they're not written down, um, then people have to sort them out from the code. And when your system is more than a couple of tens of thousands of lines, that's very difficult to do. Hmm. So, unfortunately, I think we're going to be heading towards a close in a moment or two. And, um, mm -hmm. There's a big piece of this interview that I, that I personally and selfishly like to extract from you guys because God only knows when I'd ever have an opportunity to talk to Stephen Miller again. You're in a unique situation where you are an academic professor these days, correct? Nope. No. No. Cool. I'm yeah, going to have to I, edit uh, that. Uh, I have been an adjunct at um, the Australian National University. Um, but right now I'm uh, consulting uh, not entirely all the time, but most of the time for something called the Industrial Internet Consortium, hmm. where I'm the Chief Technical Officer. And this is concerned uh, with the Industrial Internet of Things, which of course connects very directly to the um, real-time and embedded systems world, uh, but also up through the, the cloud to analytics and deriving business value from that. There's a whole series of very, very interesting technical matters there, security, privacy, resilience, availability, blah, blah, blah. Uh, my job is to uh, work with the members of the consortium to um, ensure that the work is coordinated. And so that's what I'm doing at the moment, most of the time. It's not the only thing I do, but it's what I do most of the time. So then let me frame it differently since I finally hit my, I, there's a checkbox I have to hit. I have to get something wildly wrong with every single one of you. So I'm glad I did that. We like that. Yeah. Um, so the gentleman that was walking past the bank across the street wearing the Agile is a state of mind uh, t-shirt. Yeah. If you had a chance to, after you were done physically assaulting him, um, yes. to, to talk to him about what you hope for, not just him, but for the emergence of new Agile professionals. Um, <laughs> What would you like to talk to? Like, what would you like to say to that person? And and what is your wish for the future of, if you want to call it agile, or if you, however you want to frame it, what does Stephen Miller hope for the future of our business? Well, um, I mentioned the hype curve earlier, and most people um, focus on the rise and fall. Uh, at the beginning of the curve, but what they don't see is uh, what they tend not to talk about is the rise afterwards. You know, it goes up, it goes down, and then actually it goes up again. Um, mm. So trying to um, get those techniques and technologies well understood, and I include in here the anthropological ones, um, into the marketplace I think is good. Um, giving it this name and turning it into, uh, it's not quite a religion, but it has been, uh, I think is uh, that would be dangerous because I still don't have the word I want. Um, so I would like to see those kinds of things happening. Uh, I would like to see people uh, thinking more about uh, how they can make um, the process of turning their abstractions into a reality. I won't say code. Uh, it is actually coming along. There's, there's more of that now. We're reaching the point that we're composed in components. And that leads to a whole set of other very interesting technical problems like uh, how do you uh, show that um, when you compose A with B that you don't generate an emergent behavior that you didn't expect. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, I saw, it might even have been Uncle Bob that uh, had this, but it was um, thing about unit testing. And it was two, um, two drawers uh, on a corner. And you open the one drawer and you close it and it works. And you open the other drawer 90 degrees to it and it works. And of course, you can't open them both if they interact when you try, unless you have everything absolutely closed. It doesn't work. In fact, the particular example, you couldn't even really properly open it. Um, and it, it was an example of um, unit testing versus integration testing. But mm -hmm. what I'm talking about here is composability of components. We need to get to the point. We can take a component and we're never ever going to know absolutely for sure, but have reasonable confidence that we can slot it into a larger system and it will work as advertised. Hmm. Well, I appreciate that. And I really appreciate this interview. I think you, you added a lot of things that I'm probably going to be thinking about now for a couple of days and, and unpacking mentally. Um, and let's just say others want to get in touch with you for your trainings or to, uh, to catch up on any of the resources that you have available. StephenMeller.com, right? Is the, yes. the uh, and the email address is StephenMeller at StephenMeller.com. As my nephew likes to say, it's narcissistic but easy to remember. <laughs> I like your nephew already. Um, anything uh, upcoming, any public trainings or anything that you want to get out? Uh, just go nope. to the website and find you. Yeah, there's not much on the website right now because I'm very fully occupied with the uh, consortium. Uh, so uh, I'm perfectly happy to talk to people who are interested in some of the, what I hope might be considered insights uh, in the interview. Mm. Uh, but I'm not out there trying to um, uh, sell training or consulting or anything of that nature. I'm more interested in trying to get things uh, so that people can derive value from some of the ideas. Um, I am still expecting some years down the road uh, someone else to invent the notion of executable models and claim that it is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And there will be, in fact, all sorts of conferences and people getting all very excited about it. And then one day they'll go back and they'll see some of the stuff that, uh, that I've done in this because building a model that executes, building it at a high level is a lot like just raising the level of abstraction and still being agile. I think for Christmas this year, I'm going to get you a t-shirt that says executable, executable models is a mindset. There you go. All right. I like that. <laughs> and of course, code is that, as we know. Yes. All right. Well, um, I appreciate your time uh, this evening or this afternoon for, for your end of the line. And um, give uh, for the listeners... Uh, you can find more interviews with the Agile Manifesto authors at theagileuprising.com. Uh, you can join our free community at coalition.agileuprising.com. And uh, Stephen does not do Twitter, but we do. So give us a follow at Agile Uprising on Twitter. Thanks again, Stephen. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you very much, James. <laughs>